Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dr. Boz channel. I am working with a, uh, actually I, I took my husband's computer and we are using his computer tonight. So uh, if you can hear me, make sure you uh, tell me that on the uh, uh, the chats here. I'm watching them as hey we get started. Welcome back to the Dr. Boz channel. I am looking forward to a great uh, live show here tonight. And uh, as I look at these comments, please give me a shout out from where you're from. Um, I have uh, just returned home, like within the last 30 minutes. Um, uh, thanks for saying that, Debbie, that we you hear me, because it's I'm like, this is new equipment. I don't have my regular microphone hooked up, so it's nice to hear that it's coming through loud and clear. Um, I can make some adjustments if it's not quite loud enough, so if people give me that feedback, too, that'd be great. Uh, just returned home. Um, I just minutes. actually rolled into town a few minutes ago um, thanks for saying that, Debbie, that a weekend in Pella, Iowa. Like, this is new equipment. And, um, I don't have my regular we, microphone I was invited up, there so to nice help their youth coalition do some um, education some on brains and repairing so them. Uh, it was a I sprinkle of keto um, with a whole I bunch just of actually rolled into town a few minutes ago and how do we make them better. Hello, and Iowa. I just can't this tell you how thankful I am for that community uh, to uh, be leading uh, this conversation in their community about how to help their youth, how to help their folks um, improve their addiction. Uh, it was so, a sprinkle. Uh, it wasn't just about addiction, but it was a big focus on um, what, what happens when addiction is prominent. Uh, I just can't tell you how thankful I am for that community to uh, be leading uh, this conversation. So tonight's uh, topic, I have a couple of things in mind, but I am uh, really going to listen to some of the feedback I've had just to just, when I have these lives and the folks uh, you guys do a, such a great job of typing in um, taking the uh, uh, it's echoing so tonight's uh, topic I have a couple of things in mind but I am okay so bad echo okay so um, let's see how it's doing now so I just uh, uh, adjusted something on the on the equipment again it is uh, sound is all screwed up oh okay let's see if it gets any better I'm gonna do I got a couple more buttons I can push so hold on here okay all right we're gonna try one more time uh, so if uh, it if anybody can give me a feedback much better much better okay awesome Whew. okay Again, it's new equipment, so there's a way to test it, and it tests okay when you do the recording, but when you do it live, um, dang, you just got to trust that you guys are going to give me feedback, so thank you. Um, all right, so some of, the, um, some of the plan that I was hoping to do tonight is I have a few questions that came up through this workshop, uh, folks coming up to me and asking me questions. I thought I would start with one of the questions that I think I heard three different times between um, Friday morning, I led my local uh, community uh, keto group, which I offer to my community here in Sioux Falls or the surrounding area. If you want to come here and ask questions about the ketogenic diet, uh, I offer it free every Friday. And um, when we do that, it's a powerful uh, ripple effect, I've noticed, that as soon as I... Um, educate or help somebody through a hurdle where they're stuck, um, then we, um, then they go to their church or their community or their family or their uh, workplace and their questions are more confident, their information is more confident, and um, they are able to teach others about the ketogenic diet and some of the some of the truths and some of the myths, uh, but uh, on Friday morning, right before we hopped in the car to drive five hours to Pella, Iowa, um, I had the same question, and then when I was in Pella, I think I had it two more times from uh, folks that came to the workshop. So the question was uh, about what happens uh, to our chemistry when you've been on the ketogenic diet, they've had a rapid or at least a pretty solid amount of weight loss, and they're definitely feeling better. They have an improvement, but their weight loss stalled. And um, this isn't a this isn't uncommon. You'll hear uh, if you go scroll back into the consult for why Jennifer Marie reached out to me or originally. She had mastered the rules of the ketogenic diet, and she certainly was following all of them. Uh, but she had lost almost 50 pounds, which was remarkable. And then she stalled. 
and she said, I am really doing everything right. I'm doing everything that I've read. Uh, why, why isn't my body losing weight? And I think I'm going to take just a minute. I'm going to use a couple of slides to do that. Uh, again, I really appreciate all of you that are telling me where you're from. All of those little um, those um, uh, comments help to reach other people on YouTube. Uh, another thing that I've asked people to do is push the like button whenever we're watching. You're watching a video. Uh, sounds silly, and it, you know, like buttons seem to me like they're a Facebook thing. But YouTube has started measuring those, and if we want others to reach this video, the more times we feel uh, the like button, uh, apparently that's helpful. So thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about what really is happening at a metabolic level when somebody comes in and says, Doc, I feel so much better on this diet, I really do, but I've kind of been at the same weight for maybe four or five weeks, and I'd just like to uh, see what, what, I, what I did wrong or what, I'm, what I could be doing. Um, so I'm going to go through two things. One is going to be, what is it about the metabolism deep in our um, cellular level that changes on a ketogenic diet? And of course, that first wave of weight loss is pretty predictable, but almost always they stall once they've kind of mastered that first level of improving their metabolism. And I'm going to try and explain that. Uh, again, uh, feedback is super helpful. So if you... Um, Oops, I don't want that as my slide coming up. Let's go over here. Uh, let's go to this one. All right, so I'm going to start with just reminding you of some of these basics. I know you know these, but um, it sure helps when I've, um, uh, I just start with some of the easy stuff. So again, we have three fuels. We have the carbs, we have fat, and we have protein. Um, keep in mind that I don't really like to talk about protein as the as a fuel. It, it honestly is, it gets broken down into amino acids, uh, and those amino acids are really important for how we repair and we power. Um, there, there are some essentials to that, uh, but it's really not a fuel. So the fuel part of it is it's just such a minor part of our fuel. But uh, carbs and fat are two of the major sources of fuel. Um, when you first go on the ketogenic diet, you switch off the carbohydrates and you s switch on uh, the, um, the fat. And what really happens is if you kind of look at the, the three um, sources of fuel, if you would, uh, look at that red line going up really high and then that lower blue line, which is uh, meant to represent fat. Again, when I compare these to that uh, pine needle fire, uh, if you put a bunch of pine needles, if you put a bunch of leaves into a campfire and you threw a match on it, uh, that's kind of what the carbohydrate diet does, how carbohydrates look when you burn that fuel. They are very exciting. It really does blow up a bunch of energy, uh, but it doesn't last very long. Um, let's compare that to what's happening with the, uh, the logs, okay, the part in our campfire that once it's burning, it really does sustain our energy. And this is where that, um, that part of the, um, uh, the, the patient who says, Doc, I, I, I did so good for so long. Uh, the first six, seven weeks I was losing weight every week. I couldn't believe it. I really got off the stall. But now I just seem to be stable. And I want you to imagine back to those two slides and say, before you were fueling your sugars, or you were fueling your mitochondria with a rise and fall, and a rise and fall, and a rise and fall of energy. And as we switched you over to a fat burning process, your mitochondria that were used to on and off, on and off uh, uh, as far as metabolism goes, uh, now have a steady source of what they're doing. So they're constantly busy burning that fire built from ketones or built from fat. And so here these logs are at a cellular level starting to all turn on for the first time. And as efficient as we can get about eating every four hours on a carbohydrate diet, uh, it is invariable that on those first five or six weeks that if I could have a little like thermometer or measuring unit in every one of your cells to say what is more energy? A whole bunch of times where you burned carbohydrates for a couple hours and in between that you're scrambling to kind of find the energy again. They're going through a slump. They're saying, hey, there's not enough for both of us. Let's, uh, let's, I'm going to shut down a little bit. And so you have some mitochondria shutting down, and then as soon as you put some carbs in, they'll wake back up and give you a burst of energy. And if you compare that spotty on-off, 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 
metabolism to that of the log, that long blue line that starts out when you're first on a ketogenic diet, and it's kind of low to the ground. You just have a few units that are burning the ketones, and they're fat-fueled, and the ketones have a, a powerful improvement in um, in the overall energy for your body. They'll, they'll say, Doc, I just felt so much more sustainable energy. I really was eating two meals a day, the third meal of the day. Sometimes I didn't even eat. And so you can see that they don't have to focus at putting the energy into the body every four hours. And of course, I haven't found a person that's complained about that yet, once they hit that metabolism. But the weight loss is um, because if I would compare all of the cells using ketones 24 hours a day now, because they're logs, once we start the fire, they keep going. And if you're trying to lose weight, you've got access to fat. So they get to burn those mitochondria all day, all night. Unlike what happened with the carbohydrate, which was a high dose of carbs, and then it would sink down. And then a high dose of carbs, and then it would sink down. Uh, and you would find that, um, that kind of pulsing energy in the first six weeks as compared to that of a ketone or a fat-fueled energy, which is long and steady. And now you have all day, all night, burning uh, a ketogenic fire, a log-based fire inside those cells. And sure enough, you lose weight. There is a higher metabolic rate. There's a higher energy burn when they used those logs. And so they do great. And then comes that sixth week where you know, maybe it's five weeks, six weeks, seven weeks, somewhere in that kind of, oh, now I have really gotten used to this. I honestly thought you were telling me a fib that I would not want food every few hours. I really can feel that I don't need that. Um, and there, uh, but the scale stopped moving. So again, over the last um, three days, I've had at least three people ask me this question, what do I do now? So I'm using this, uh, these questions to get the first one out and then I'll come back and answer some of your questions uh, on the chat. So you've got this metabolism. It did this huge shift at first. It woke several mitochondria out of the sleepy phase or out of the carb on and off phase and now it's constantly burning. And then it gets comfortable. Then the cells say, hey, you know what? Our job is to meet the demands of what is happening to, in this body. And they did. They met those demands just fine. They helped you fuel. And then you're stable. It's usually at this point that I am going to ask you for some numbers. So you'll go from using your urine ketone sticks, your urine ketones where you pee on a stick. Um, and now I'm going to want to get some more information by saying, what's that morning fasting glucose and what's your blood ketones? Again, the difference between the urine ketones and those blood ketones. Uh, so urine ketones are the ketones that didn't get used and your body spilled them into your urine saying, we don't need the extra, let's get rid of them. Great weight loss fame plan when you get rid of calories through peeing them out. But really it's the way your body's keeping that pH, uh, uh, that acid-base ratio is perfectly controlled as it needs to be. Uh, but your body doesn't, uh, it's not It's not meant to waste ketones. When it's wasting ketones, it's a message that's kind of coming back to your body saying, hey, you're making more of this than we need. That's not very efficient. We'd like you to make the amount of ketones that her body needs. And, and eventually, over those six weeks, you'll find that the amount of ketone production from the liver and the amount of ketone burning from the body matches. And then their metabolism stays stable. And that's where they hit this weight loss problem, uh, where they say, hey, doc, I'm following all your rules, but I haven't lost any more weight. And that's where we need to send a stress, a healthy stress to your system to make more of the mitochondria burn some logs or make them burn logs, logs at a fast, ketones at a faster rate, or recruit another crop of ketones. So let's take the first one, uh, first uh, gal that came to talk to me. I'll tell you, she actually made my day when I was in Pella, Iowa. Uh, she came up to me and she had printed a t-shirt <laughs> that said, he, uh, improving your health, one ketone at a time. And it was in quotes and it had my name under it. I totally signed her t-shirt and took a picture with her. I just want to say thank you. That made my weekend. I've never had that happen before. 
Um, but she said, I've done so well on this. I really find that my metabolism has improved. My health has improved. I think she said she lost 40 pounds over the last six months. Um, but she had stalled and she wanted to know what to do next. So the first thing I uh, ask her is, what time do you eat? And she said, oh, I've, I've heard your lectures. I know that I'm supposed to eat in the earlier parts of the day and not later in the day. And so she described her schedule that she does get up around 4.30 or 5 for her work schedule, uh, has a really busy day um, until about uh, 2 in the afternoon, and then she gets off of her work schedule and is usually in bed by around 7 or 8 o'clock at night in order to get up like at 3 in the morning. So she has a, a bit of a shift in her schedule, but she said, no, 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 I've heard this. You need to have your eating window opening when the sun happens and then for about eight hours more that's about that's as generous as I like to be if they're stuck not able to lose weight I, I, I get them to focus that putting their eating window during those first eight hours of sunlight is really important uh, this is the other thing that we talked about at my my local keto group on Friday was uh, I had a nurse present and she said something that really helped me say oh that's a much better way to teach that so she said um, feed the cortisol. <laughs> so when you wake up in the morning, the reason you wake up is there is a ping uh, from your pineal gland that sends messages, a message down to your liver uh, to release some stored sugar. And that stored sugar, that stored glycogen, that glycogen stored glucose, um, increases your blood sugar and that's what wakes your brain up. And we do this, we've done this for thousands of years. This is how our brains wake up and it's dependent on the sun. Even when you fast, there's a cortisol spike. It is from your circadian rhythm and it's built in. You cannot escape it. When I first started fasting, I it was easiest for me to skip uh, breakfast and then even lunch and eat supper with my family. Um, but I did the same thing that most women over the age of 40 do is they were able to uh, see a pretty hearty weight loss at first and then it kind of stalls out because you make this cortisol, especially women over 40, sorry to tell you this, but you make this cortisol um, and uh, it is highest from that circadian rhythm for about the next eight hours. If you eat after that eight hours, you send another cortisol surge again for your body to burn again. And cortisol increases blood sugar. So you only want one cycle of that in your day. You cannot stop the sun from churning those glucose and waking up your, sending the message from your brain to your body to wake up. You cannot stop that. Even if you're on the night shift, it still happens. But what you can do is you can match that your eating happens in a time where you already have that cortisol increased in your, uh, in your circulation and you then don't get two surges of cortisol in those 24 hours. So here was this patient, or here was this gal who came up to me during the workshop and she said, all right, I totally need to ask you this question. Um, I've, I've done great. I've lost these 40 pounds. I'm following your rule that I, I, I don't eat eight hours after the sun rises, but I truly have been stuck at this weight for probably four, five or six weeks. And I just want to know what, what is the next step? Um, she was doing several of the, um, I love the, the, the comment there saying, I hate that damn cortisol. <laughs> Women, we do have to deal with this, yes. Uh, when you look at um, uh, what I asked her to do next, I said, are you checking your numbers? She's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I check my numbers. I've got a ketone monitor. Um, uh, I look at my glucose. My Dr. Boz ratio gets under 40. I'm doing pretty well, and I've been doing well for probably two months, uh, but it's been the last six weeks where the weight hasn't come off. And so I said, all right what is your longest fast? <laughs> and it's like her cheeks flushed. She's like, <gasps> yeah, I've made it 18 hours. I've, I've never made it longer than that. And I push her to say, well, um, if you're kind of eating at the end of that eight hour, hour window and then you have a coffee in the morning, that will get her the 18 hours is how she's keeping her, um, you know, that six hour window where she does eat. And so she is following the rules. But I said, all right, you are ready for the next step, which is to fast 24 hours. And if you can, fast 36 hours. Um, I actually think that the 36 hours was easier for me than the 24. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Um, he here's this gal who, who the, um, if you kind of imagine what was going on in her uh, liver. Hang tight, I'm going to use this slide deck again to give 
um, let's see here, this one, to give a little bit of a summary here. So if you look at, um, again, the, the mitochondria, where you have uh, uh, fuel in the mitochondria, fueling the mitochondria is what we are manipulating. And when she first went to the ketogenic diet, her mitochondria were fueled, fueled by those carbs. Now she has the, the fat that is fueling her mitochondria. We just need to increase the number of uh, cells that are churning. And her body has matched the ketone production with what the ketone use is. And so she's stable. Now, she's much less inflamed. Her joints don't hurt. She is has energy better than she's ever had. Her mental fog is gone. She had so many praises present in her uh, in her uh, testimony that I could have I should have recorded her. Uh, but what she wants is she wants the next 20 pounds off for to get to her ideal body weight. So in her case, we need to increase the number of mitochondria that are burning ketones. And how are we going to do this? We're going to have to give her body a stress. Yes, um, I'm going to show you one more uh, slide here that kind of I think does a good job of saying what, what are we trying to, to accomplish. We are getting away from, oops, that's not the one I want. We are getting her Dr. Boz ratio um, has been in that 40 or 20, under 40s is where she says most of the time she finds her Dr. Boz ratio. And I think this slide does the best job of saying don't forget the reason, the reason we needed to do that uh, was to lower her insulin that she didn't know her insulin was elevated, but it was clearly uh, the source of what uh, her, uh, her, her cellular locks, if you would, her cells had been locked the fuel inside. And to get the fat to release uh, that energy, to get her uh, mitochondria to go from burning glucose to ketones, um, insulin was what was hidden behind all of the inflammation and that metabolism that's really in storage mode, not in kind of rejuvenation mode. So as she gets her Dr. Boz ratio um, and keeps it under 40, um, I have said, all right, we need to recruit some more of those ketones, uh, recruit some more of those uh, uh, mitochondria, and really that meant she needs um, to uh, fast. <laughs> There's just no other way around it. She needs to fast. So what I, she said, well, I, do you think you could make it 24 hours? And she said, I, I probably could. And before I hardly got that message done, I said, what about 36? And here's why. So there is a mentality part of this. Uh, just like the first time that you go onto the ketogenic diet, you think you can't give up carbohydrates and your, <laughs> your body gives a, 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 like a signal that, you know, this past weekend, I, did a big conference on addiction and brains of addiction. And it did not take much to show when people are coming off of addiction, whether it's alcohol or heroin or um, you know other substances, carbohydrates parallel exactly uh, that same pattern that when you take it away, your brain says, hey, I don't know how to deal with life without these carbohydrates. They're my comfort. And I think some of that carries over to what happens with um, that first fast. So I asked this gal to see if she could reach for 36 hours because um, I think it works out well mentally. So I tell them to eat a really nice supper. Um, you know, like I start fasting on Sundays and I try to make it to Tuesday. 36 hours is what I my goal is. Um, but on Sunday we try to have a really nice meal. And I, especially on the first fast, I encourage them to eat until you feel full. Eat until you feel full. There is a hormone response that is a wonderful, uh, kind of almost nauseating feeling that when those fat hormones are flowing, when you get that cholecystokinin high enough, um, you have this uh, kind of almost nauseating feeling that I couldn't eat another bite. That is related to the fat that's gone into your body. You actually have cells that sense that and they send a message to your brain saying, hey, we got enough, you can stop now. Uh, what is unfortunate is we do not have cells that register the carbohydrates when you swallow them. Uh, and unfortunately, if you've ever said, I'm really full, but I have this like second stomach where I could have a cookie or I could have ice cream or I could have some carbohydrates or just a little bit of a sugar snack, 
at the end of a meal. And I would encourage you not to do that, but uh, uh, you, you can't sense it. You don't get nauseated from carbs at the end of that moment, but any more bite of fat, you do get nauseated from. Uh, one of the experiments I have people do when I uh, in the book that I wrote um, was there's a chapter in here that says, hey, um, I want you to get up tomorrow morning and eat a stick of butter. <laughs> and I've had a few people write back saying, you didn't mean that, did you? I'm like, yeah, I did. And what happens is it's almost impossible to eat the whole stick of butter. <laughs> but what you do sense is most of my patients as they enter onto the ketogenic diet, it has been so long since they felt full that they kind of forgot what it feels like. I'm like, no, no, no. You'll remember. You'll remember really quickly. You're, it's built in. Eat the stick of butter and about two-thirds the way full, you're going to feel like, Ugh, I just can't eat another bite. Uh, but if somebody puts a chocolate chip cookie in front of you, um, unfortunately, people say, but I could eat that. Why is it? And it's because your cells within that first section of your gut cannot sense carbohydrates. They can sense fat. Yes. So here's the scale. She's going to have her big supper on the night. Maybe she'll start tonight on a Sunday night. And I want her to eat until she feels full. That, that sense of uh, satiety or fullness is really powerful in how you get through tomorrow. In that first fast of now you go to bed, you wake up the next morning and you have like 10 hours under your belt uh, and now you just have um, 26 hours to go. <laughs> so keep going. Uh, you'll, this is the hardest day. But if you're already on the ketogenic diet, those mornings usually aren't that bad. So I've said get up, have black coffee instead of coffee with cream in it. Don't put any butter in it that day. Don't have any MCT oil. And if you, if you get in a pickle, we can use those things, but let's start out without those things. And uh, again, that's a learned skill. <laughs> that's not always the easiest thing to say goodbye to. I had a really tough time moving my wonderful heavy whipping cream in my coffee to black coffee. Yeah. So you get through that uh, part of the day and I specifically encourage them to try to do this when they're, when they're busy. Uh, she, you know, this gal had uh, reported how hard it was that every time there was a break at work, everyone around her was eating all these carbohydrate things. And that's really where she seems to have the temptation that um, she doesn't necessarily eat anything not keto, but she finds herself eating even if she's not hungry. Um, it's in that case that I said, if you haven't figured out how to make bone broth, um, there's a couple of my early videos I have actually frozen chicken feet that I showed people what they look like and how important it was that if you use this in your recipe for bone broth, it really increases the nutrient density. <laughs> Sounds really disgusting, but uh, it, it is amazing how uh, a little bit of bone broth could help you. And again, our goal is to get you to the point where you don't need bone broth, but there's something about the salty, highly nutrient um, bone broth uh, that I, I like to talk about the bone broth that gels. And again, uh, my good friend gave me the recipe to put in my book, and I did put that in there because I it was life saving to my mom. Uh, when uh, if she's getting into that second day and finds that her her um, her breaks at work or where she falls off the wagon, that little bit fourth of a cup is not much. That's like three swallows if you're. If you're gulping, probably two swallows of liquid. Uh, but just sipping on that bone broth and uh, the high salt and the warmth, I cannot tell you how much that helps you to get through that skill of learning how to fast. And then what I would highly, highly recommend next is find an activity that you love to do that has nothing to do with food. <laughs> so I first I did I scheduled a couple of massages and said, okay, I'm going to fast. I'm going to make it 70. I was going for 72 hours. So it was for me that second night was really hard. Um, so I would schedule a, a fast. Um, I'm a huge fan of the, um, the Epsom salt floats, those float spas. And again, you're kind of in this sensory deprivation. You don't have any sound, any sight, and you're in water. So it's kind of hard to eat. <laughs> so uh, again, getting a, a nice, uh, um, plan for what you're going to do the evening of that kind of coming up on that 24 hours and then um, like duct tape the door to the kitchen go right past the kitchen go into your bed and shut down and go to sleep and I really think that um, you know finding a an activity of pleasure 
uh, on that night of fasting does a couple of things. Uh, we talked about this at the um, this brain repair process that you know finding coping skills that comfort us that aren't food <laughs> are really powerful. Uh, we do this when we help somebody off of any type of addiction, whether it's alcohol or or you know watching too much television, playing too many video games. What other ways can you comfort yourself? And I think sitting still and thinking about that before you head off onto your first 36-hour fast is a powerful. Um, testimony for what happens uh, in uh, learning to fast. So I ask her to say, if you can, if you can find uh, something you love to do, plan it on the night of the, that 24-hour mark. Um, embrace it. Really be mindful. Be in the moment of that. And then when you come home from that activity, um, uh, you can dive into your bed and not, not, go, to, not go to the kitchen. Uh, again, you'll wake up in the morning and that puts you almost at that 36 hour point depending on what time you started and I just really find that a 36 hour fast was a lot easier for me uh, the first few times I did it than somehow the 24 hour fast I would start nibbling at like 22 hours and I'm like oh, I'm almost there I'm fine um, and I found that my numbers did not do nearly the improvement of my Dr. Boz ratio uh, and the weight didn't change much um, when I went from that 18 hour fasting um, to 24 like eh, I don't think I noticed much, but when I went all the way up to um, the 36 hour fast, it was impressive. Um, and then I'll, I'll warn you, the same thing usually happens is that um, your body will say this is stressful. We need to rise to meet the demands of what this body has asked us to do. And those uh, mitochondria are going to produce more ketones and then your body will use them. Um, Without fuel coming in, this shift of metabolism, it changes. Now you have more little logs on the fire that are burning. So if you look at this, um, if you look at this uh, little picture here, mm, let me see here, uh, hold on. Um, yes, if you look at this, uh, that one at the bottom there, that blue, where fat is burned, when you first start on the ketogenic diet, it is really low. But each time that you raise the metabolism, you recruit a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more uh, mitochondria burning those logs, burning that, that, that fuel. And that is where the weight loss comes from, is now you have more, more people on the, on the team of the mitochondria uh, that burn ketones instead of on the team of the mitochondria that burn glucose. And so you take that blue line, and I can't point to it, I wish I could point to it, but um, and, and you rise it probably up to where that dotted line is. So again, you it just have a whole bunch of your mitochondria now producing ketones that allow you um, the, the um, privilege of an enhanced metabolism. And that's where the weight loss comes from. Uh, last summer, I did this experiment with a patient where we did a 72-hour fast, and I didn't really want to do that. <laughs> I was like, no thanks, but she was having a tough time coming up with the courage to do it, so I said, okay, I'll do it with you. And I'll be honest, it was incredible how much better my metabolism was um, after, I think I, I set a goal of eight weeks of doing that 72-hour fast, and it took me 10 weeks to get eight 72-hour fasts in because I screwed it up a couple times, uh, but oh, it was awesome. It was the, I did have another step down on my weight and another improvement in my mental uh, function, uh, just stamina, focus, uh, concentration. It was great. So that uh, process of what happens when you stall, um, what happens when the weight loss stalls. Number one, if you haven't figured out that morning window of you can't control the cortisol that wakes you up in the morning. You have eight hours to get your feeding window in. So if you don't start it for a few hours, just remember, try to stop eating eight hours after the sun comes up. That's a very powerful rule if your weight loss has stalled. Number two, you should be checking your numbers. Those Dr. Boz ratios are really important. And if you're trying to get weight loss, the morning uh, glucose and ketones, the morning Dr. Boz ratio should be less than 80 every day if you want to lose weight. And if you're not, you're eating, you got to fast for longer before you wake up. I mean, you got to back up the eating hour. You got to take it further into the afternoon. And if you've already done that, the third thing is, is you need to do intermittent fasting with longer hours. And I tell you this as a way to be careful. Uh, if you're new to the ketogenic diet, 
First of all, don't be poking your finger. Don't worry about your Dr. Boss ratio. Get those urine ketones and just make sure you're peeing urine ketones for the first four or five weeks. Don't get distracted with calories. Uh, don't get distracted with fiber. You want 20 grams of carbs or less and you are going to have an amazing transition. Try to stay away from sugar substitutes. Uh, try to stay away from uh, eating late at night. Um, but that that is minor compared to just P ketones, P ketones. It's amazing. Uh, it's this more advanced questions where um, they've really done a great job at getting off their blood pressure medicines, getting off of their um, uh, their evening snacks and shedding pounds. And they want to take it to the next level. So um, as to not uh, uh, stall out and give up, I give them that information to uh, say, Take it to the next level with an intermittent fasting. If you're if you're in the um, uh, if you're in the mindset that you can do that, so don't start out there. I just try to make sure that the audience that watches this are everywhere from our beginners um, to advanced, and so I just want to make sure this um, this uh, message is for those of you that said, "Hey, guess what? You have." Um, uh, you've reached your uh, threshold, your metabolism is matching your production of ketones. If you want to lose weight, you got to increase the amount of ketones that you produce. And um, so I'm going to go to some of the questions now, and uh, some of them will be along the side that you're at, but I have some other ones that I... Um, I have Cliff Holland here who says, unable to get ketones above 0.8. Um, my precision extra meter says the sugars are 70 to 80, but that makes his Dr. Boz ratio about like 120 to 130-ish. So uh, eating almost zero carbs uh, other than veggies. Any suggestions to raise ketone levels? So Cliff, I don't have a picture of you, but I am just going to, um, I wonder how long you've been on the ketogenic diet. Uh, usually they hit this 0.8 level at about the two-month part. Uh, where they've said, geez, I'm checking numbers, I'm doing good, but this ratio is high and I'm not losing weight. Uh, I know I talk about females and how that, that cortisol churn, uh, and like my nurse said at the meeting, uh, feed, the, feed the cortisol. When the cortisol's high is when you want to be eating, because if you wait till evening to eat, then you're going to send another cortisol surge again. And it's hardly something you can measure. Um, when they're eating all carbs, you're like, what's a little more cortisol? Who can tell? Uh, but when you've got your metabolism cleaned up and you're on a ketone fuel, now we can see that that cortisol happens during those first eight hours of the day. And we don't want that to happen again if you want to lose weight. So I would make sure you push that eating window back to eight hours after sunrise and then zip it. That's zero salt, water, maybe some iced tea. Uh, I don't know if you want to do black coffee at night, but whatever. That would be okay. That's kind of hard to sleep, but uh, what you're looking for is after that window is closed, zero zilch. Um, another mistake I see happening with folks like the problem you've talked about, Cliff, is um, I am a big proponent that you should not be thinking about exercise when you go to lose weight. We can talk about exercise and how it is help, helpful and healthy for you, um, but when we're changing a behavior like giving up carbs, it is enough. Just keep the blinders on, focused on what you're eating. Quit adding more to your plate uh, by adding an exercise schedule or doing something more um, uh, that uh, it's just too many changes at once and none of them are going to stick. So based on that, um, if you if you say, I just don't think I can change my eating window, I would start adding a little exercise because again, you're going to increase the demand of what your body needs if you increase that exercise and you say, I've got a pretty good rhythm of how I eat. Um, adding exercise would be uh, something that you could do at that point and that would stimulate your ketones. It would probably take three or four days for you really to see the increase uh, ketones there. Um, but the other thing is to put your window in those uh, of eating in the eight hours after sunrise. All right, that's a good question though. So let's see. Um, uh, let's see, I'm going to scroll saying I have Robin C says, I've only been on the keto diet for about 20 days. I can do a 72-hour fast, but I get awful headaches mm, about 12 hours in. 
Is it just salt needed? Can't complain about the weight loss. I'm close to 18 pounds down. Okay, so that is a perfect example of what happens to a newbie. Very good job. She's in that great time where she's losing the weight. Um, we don't need her checking urine ketones. She's got a pretty stable uh, um, uh, chemistry that you don't even have to look to know that her chemistry for that kind of weight loss is still in a very, she's making more ketones than she's needing to use. So her metabolism is trying to, to match the production of those ketones yet um, but what one of the most incredible mistakes is what happens uh, in that first 10 days of a ketogenic diet is you flush out a bunch of fluid that ha has been stored um, it does make me think that you probably haven't read this this is the book that uh, I think is my favorite it is my favorite teaching tool if you haven't bought it it is how I support this channel um, all the proceeds from this allow me to pay the people who help me edit the videos and um, get a new computer here <laughs> um, which um, and just uh, focus the time away from seeing patients uh, and as to putting together videos and making sure I can uh, keep up with the onslaught of questions. So it makes me think, Robin, that you haven't read the book because I talk about in those first 10 days, if you haven't uh, figured out that magnesium is, is a huge part of that, uh, it's not just salt. You can use salt. You're going to feel better. That will be step number one. But that headache is a warning that you've quickly dropped the blood pressure. And we drop blood pressure really quickly when we get rid of fluid. Uh, you can drink all you want, but if you put the water in without replacing the salt, you're going to pee it right back out and not really move forward. So the two things that I recommend when people get to that 10 days is I say five floats in seven days. Uh, what does that mean? It does not mean root beer float. <laughs> I've had a couple of patients say, you should be careful to explain that because they recently have given up carbohydrates. But in five days, if you could do a float spa, uh, I mean, excuse me, in seven days, if you could do five float spas, you would not believe the number of symptoms that you would repair. From muscle cramps to chronic headaches to a bowel that's not working so well, um, I could put you into the clinic and I could put an IV in your arm and drip in magnesium. In fact, if you're pregnant and you've ever had preterm labor and they put you in the hospital on a drip, uh, what's in that drip is magnesium. So if I put too much magnesium in you, you're just going to pee it out. Perfect, no problem. Um, it's, not, it's really hard to be toxic on magnesium is what I'm showing you. The danger of magnesium replacement is if you swallow it, a big glut of uh, magnesium is something I could use to flush out your bowels. <laughs> I could get you ready for a colonoscopy by having you drink a bunch of magnesium in a hurry. So um, one of the cheapest ways to replace magnesium is to go get milk of magnesia which is meant for helping people with constipation and they take a glut of it and they could help themselves to the antidote uh, but what I tell folks to do is take about a tablespoon put it in the water you drink all day long and sip on that water uh, adding magnesium in tiny doses throughout the day is a really good way to keep um, magnesium replaced there are some uh, supplements out there that are slow mag, and that also would help your headaches. Um, but when I see people in those first two, three weeks of a ketogenic diet and they're getting a headache that's significant, I will tell them, stop, 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 stop fasting. You can go to one meal a day, that's fine, but try not to go any further than that until we get this headache thing figured out. Um, and that the fastest, best way to do that is uh, to soak yourself in a very saturated magnesium water. And that's what these float spas are. It is so saturated with Epsom salt that you float, which is how they get the name. Kind of like the Dead Sea salt, kind of just so saturated with minerals that they float. Um, there are not a lot of things that your body allows to absorb through your skin, but magnesium is one of them. So this is just a great trick to say five floats, seven days, and don't do any more 72-hour fast until the headaches stop. Uh, it can create a syndrome of headaches, so I wouldn't do that. Um, but congratulations on the weight loss. Keep up the work. Uh, welcome to the ketogenic diet. <laughs> um, all right, so let's do a, a couple more. Uh, John uh, C. says, Dr. Boz, the only place I found your diet book is on your website. Can I also get any way you can from the website instead of Amazon? Yeah, so here's the deal. That's a good question, John, because I've had that question, and I've looked into getting it into bookstores, which I could do, but I haven't done yet. 
um, it just takes a lot of money <laughs> to get it uh, into the bookstores. You have to pay that part up front. So I was a newbie author and I used um, uh, direct publishing through Amazon. And as much as that is some people's, they don't like that, um, I still uh, have to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, for Amazon's ability for a new author to be able to say, I have a story, I would absolutely uh, love to share this with other people, and it really has changed the lives of so many people. I just looked the other day and I have over 900 people that have written in a review on Amazon, and of course that just helps to share that information with other people. Um, every book sale, um, there is not a, I mean it's self-published, so I mean I, I think I make like three dollars a book but I don't care it's it's not there's not a publisher in between me and them uh, so I get to use that to fund the time I would spend seeing patients uh, and then hopefully I've been working on writing another book at this rate it's gonna be a year before I get that done but <laughs> I'm really committed to saying no, no no I do not want to add another thing to my list until I get that second book written and it has a lot to do with what we talk about on this channel I use your questions to help me to see where did I get that message correct a lot of feedback when you guys put comments on there and say um, I don't think I understood what you said or I think you should explain it this way I actually take that into consideration as I'm trying to teach a message that connects with an audience so I just want to say thank you so the answer to your question, sir, is I don't have it anywhere except on Amazon right now. I am looking to figure out, can I get it into, into stores? And um, uh, on my own website, it is something I've thought about publishing, uh, printing enough and then sending. Uh, I do own the ability to do that. So printing them and putting them on my website is something I've thought about. You know, my favorite version of the book, though, is Audible. Uh, if you look in the show notes below, you'll see the Audible link. And um, I read the book. I did the audio audio book. Um, at first, I thought I would be too <laughs> too much, but boy, I really enjoyed it. And you can tell uh, as I talk about uh, some of the tender moments I had with my mom, it really did uh, come out great. I didn't expect it to be that great, but um, so let's see. I see. We'll do two more questions, and then we will uh, call it a night. Um, so Tara says, I can keep my Dr. Boz ratio between 40 and 80 every day when I fast 12 hours. I can get lower than 40, but I am not losing weight. Should I go longer fast if my ratio is already less than 40? Yeah, yeah. so here would be the answer to Tara's question. If we could have, you've seen me order the continuous glucose monitor where you could just take your phone over and check your glucose uh, and the, the monitor lasts for two weeks. You don't have to poke yourself. You would have a constant reading almost of your glucose. And for a diabetic, uh, amazing. But I think it's also great for somebody who's in a castal of saying, well, what am I eating that's making my sugar go up? Uh, but I would want both numbers. I would want my glucose and my ketones to say, if you're checking your, your Dr. Boz ratio and it's between 40 and 80, good job. You do have a good chemistry. It should be resulting in some weight loss. Um, if the weight loss is stalled for only like 10 days, I would say just give it a little bit longer. Um, but if you say, you know, doc, I've been stuck there at this uh, same weight for a good four weeks and my ratios have been 40 to 80, uh, I would contend that the most powerful teaching moment for your numbers is first thing in the morning. Uh, when people check their Dr. Boz ratio later and later in the day, it's still very helpful. You learn a lot about what your body's up to. Um, but if you're wondering what's the puzzle, what's wrong, the most valuable information is that one first thing in the morning. Again, it's the cleanest metabolism. It's what your body's been doing after rest. You may have had your cortisol spike. Uh, you probably have because you're awake. Um, and so that is a predictable spike, though. You should have a similar cortisol surge day after day after day after day. Uh, you can see it lower over time if you've got an improved metabolism. But yesterday's number to today's number are going to be really difficult um, uh, before uh, you get... Uh, too much um, uh, stock put into uh, your Dr. Boz ratio later in the day, I say uh, check first thing in the morning, use that as your best monitor. Um, using, uh, it sounds like Foracare is still my favorite. Um, if you type in DRBOZ when you purchase Fora6, uh, it is a ketone glucose monitor. They give you a little discount if you do that. 
Um, but more importantly, you're using a good monitor, you've got good numbers, um, and now you're saying, but why haven't I lost weight? So make sure, A, your weight loss uh, assessment is not just a 10-day assessment. It's, it's like three or four weeks that you haven't lost weight. And then um, you can uh, step into the next level, which is uh, extending the time between fasts. And if I was... Um, uh, if you if you want my my what I would do if it was me is I would move your eating time earlier in the day. Uh, that's the most uh, powerful changes that result in weight loss. Um, all right, so I did take care of a bunch of questions today. I, I did want to give out uh, a prayer request, actually. So over the weekend, as I was pulling out of uh, town, um, I've talked about my dad and his kidneys before. Um, he has had his kidneys. Um, go down to 18% for the last year, meaning uh, he's lost um, you know, nearly 80% of his kidney function. Uh, and your kidneys are really resilient. They will keep up. But in recent days, he's lost a few more points on his kidney function. And we had to make a huge decision on Friday on whether or not he was going, or on Thursday of last week, on whether or not he was going to um, start dialysis. Uh, now, many of you have asked, are, isn't uh, this keto diet hard on kidneys? And I'm like, uh, you should watch these videos. I have had my dad on a ketogenic diet. Um, you know, when mom's story happened, he lost about 30 pounds being on the ketogenic diet and really stalled out about 210 pounds. When his kidney function came back about a year and a half, about a year ago or so, um, of being compromised, he, um, he said, well, what should I do? And so I sat down and I did the calculations and said, Dad, you have enough kidney cells to support 162 pounds of body mass, so you should lose that much weight. And by golly, he did. It took him about six months. He used the ketogenic diet. He got the weight off and he kept it off. Um, but kidneys aren't very forgiving. So he has been pretty stable until recent days. And uh, they've put a shunt into his abdomen in hopes to do what they call peritoneal dialysis, where... Um, his, um, they will put a bunch of water in his abdomen and then pull it out while he's sleeping. It's called peritoneal dialysis. Um, and it's, it's very tender time. So if, um, if I've learned one thing about being an uh, authentic educator uh, on YouTube to people I don't even know, um, not only have they rewarded me with um, a book that's made a huge difference to a lot of people, but the prayer really does help people. And I would ask you to pray for my dad. I'm signing off, Dr. Boz. <laughs> Improving your health one ketone at a time.